Funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by the members of the New Jersey Education Association. Making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. And New Jersey Realtors, the voice of real estate in New Jersey. More information is online at njrealtor.com. Tonight on NJ Spotlight News, it's day one of Senator Bob Menendez's federal corruption trial. Jury selection is well underway. Menendez facing 16 counts, including bribery. Every case is different, but it's hopeful that by the end of the week, they're getting to opening statements with the jury impaneled and sworn in. Plus, rolling the dice. Casino workers sue the state to enforce a stricter smoking ban. I've been working in a casino for almost 30 years. I've never heard any employee ever say, I would like to work in a smoking area. Also, dozens of Rutgers students walk out of graduation, showing solidarity for the tens of thousands of Palestinians killed in Gaza. And educators and literacy groups team up to teach media literacy to help students decipher information in this digital age. I definitely do feel empowered by what I've learned here because I now know so much more about the way that this entire thing works and the way the internet itself functions. NJ Spotlight News begins right now. From NJ PBS Studios, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venosi. Good evening and thanks for joining us this Monday night. I'm Brianna Venosi. For the second time in less than a decade, New Jersey senior U.S. Senator today found himself inside a federal courtroom on trial for bribery and corruption charges. This time, Bob Menendez is fighting allegations that he traded his political influence for cash, gold bars, and other luxuries to benefit three New Jersey businessmen and aid the governments of Egypt and Qatar. As jury selection got underway, the 70-year-old Democrat sat with his lawyers and two of his co defendants, New Jersey businessmen Fred Davies and Whale Hanna, who are accused of paying Menendez the bribes. A third businessman, Jose Uribe, accepted a plea deal and is cooperating with the government, while the senator's wife, Nadine Menendez, a key figure in the case, will be tried separately in July, after she undergoes surgery for an undisclosed medical condition. Menendez is facing 16 felony charges, including bribery, fraud, obstruction of justice, and acting as an unregistered foreign agent, of which he's pleaded not guilty. Judge Sidney Stein today said once the jury is selected, the trial is expected to last up to seven weeks. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan was one of a handful of reporters who got to the courthouse early enough to get a seat inside the room and joins us from Manhattan with the latest. Brenda. Brianna, most of today was spent on jury selection here over at the federal courthouse in Manhattan. That's day one of a trial that's expected to run six or seven weeks. Senator Bob Menendez again fighting charges of bribery and corruption. He's accused of selling his influence, using it to benefit his co-conspirators, businessmen in New Jersey, but also foreign governments, Egypt and Qatar. Now, in exchange, he got allegedly hundreds of thousands of dollars and gold bars that agents found stashed around his house that were used to fund a lavish lifestyle for himself and his wife, Nadine. Now, this morning, Menendez breezed into the courthouse at a brisk walk. I saw him right outside the courtroom. We exchanged a pleasant good morning. He seemed upbeat. He was smiling, talking with his attorneys, but he's been through this before. He beat a corruption rap back in 2017 with a hung jury. But it's apparent that there's some tension between Menendez's legal team and the prosecution here over documents that were requested but were not turned over. And the judge, Judge Sidney Stein, admonished both of them. He said, quote, there's been too much gamesmanship here and I want it to end now. Everyone should operate in good faith and I'm not sure I've seen that. Then jury selection started. Judge Stein essentially crowded 100 prospective jurors into courtroom A23, and then he questioned them one at a time to see who could essentially make it through a seven-week trial, nine to five, Monday through Friday. Now, those who remain are gonna go through the regular voir dire. 
there will be subject to questions from the prosecution and the defense. Altogether, they all get 40 strikes. Now, those who remain could get asked, do you have opinions about people who keep cash in their homes? Have you ever purchased bars of gold or silver? And are people from New Jersey more likely to be guilty to commit crimes? Now, let's talk about who was not here. Two people were not in the courtroom, Nadine Menendez, the senator's wife. She's also been charged in this indictment. However, she's going to be tried separately. She is apparently having an, uh, surgery for an undisclosed medical issue. And the prosecution's star witness, his name is Jose Uribe. He's one of the three New Jersey businessmen that were originally indicted with Senator Menendez. He flipped. He essentially pleaded guilty to seven counts, and now he's going to testify for the prosecution. Now, we're going to be getting a better idea of the defense and the prosecution strategies during opening arguments. At this point, this is where we stand with the jury. Out of 100 that were brought in, 38 were struck as being just not able to keep up with a seven-week trial. The judge is bringing in 50 more, and there'll be more questions asked tomorrow. I'm Brenda Flanagan reporting from Manhattan at the Federal Courthouse for NJ Spotlight News. Back to you, Bree. All right, thank you, Brenda. Well, as we mentioned, if this all sounds familiar, that's because the senator was tried for corruption seven years ago. That case in 2017 involved separate allegations that Menendez took bribes from a wealthy Florida eye doctor, but it ended in a mistrial. Menendez went on to win re-election, and prosecutors in his current case allege commit even more brazen corrupt acts. The senator's defense attorneys claim the government has been trying to get back at Menendez ever since. Joining me to talk about the nature of the new charges and what we can expect throughout this trial is former federal prosecutor Chris Carmichione. Chris Carmichione, good to have you on the show. I'm happy to get your perspective on this. Let me just ask you first, what's different about this case for Senator Menendez this go around? What do prosecutors have to prove? Well, in this case, they, they, uh, they've alleged a much more specific quid pro quo or this for that, which is a standard that's required under federal jurisprudence to be able to prove an ex a conspiracy to commit extortion and bribery. Uh, it can't. It has to be specific. If you do this for me, if you exercise this official action on my behalf, I will in return give you this thing of value, which in this case the indictment alleges is cash, a uh, luxury sports car, and, and gold bars, and et cetera. So they have to be able to connect um, those cash payments, uh, the car, there was a diamond ring in the mix as well. They have to be able to directly connect those to the acts or the favors that Menendez uh, carried out? That's right. It has to be specifically linked to that. And it doesn't need to be in terms of the evidence that's provided to the jury. You don't need to necessarily have it in writing and, you know, some written confession or recording. If the circumstantial evidence is enough for them to conclude that, then that's sufficient. But the jury will get instructed that that, that quid pro quo, that this for that, has to be specific. Um, uh, uh, several years ago, the Virginia governor, McDonald, the Supreme Court struck down a, a theft of honest services prosecution under the same statute. And they, they ruled that this specificity was required. And part of the reason that is, is because an elected official like a senator in this case, they carry out official sworn obligations and duties. So the burden on the government is to be able to show he might have taken this official action or inaction or otherwise, but the purpose of it was not because of his sworn senatorial obligations and duties. It was to personally enrich himself or his loved ones or his family. So they have to make that connection and prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. And so with that said, would it be fair to assess that the prosecution has a stronger case this time than the corruption charges that were brought against the senator back in 2017, that trial, of course, ending in a hung jury? Well, just reading from the written indictments that were returned in each, I think so. They came loaded for bear in this particular indictment, and they've since superseded it, as you're aware, after one of the co-defendants, Jose Uribe, agreed to plead guilty and cooperate. So they went into great detail in what's commonly referred to as a speaking indictment to not just make the allegations, but explain and corroborate how they arrive at that. And the way they do that is through text communications, recordings, emails, and 
evidence of what's uh, evidence of concealment, which is really valuable in a criminal prosecution because when you're often when when a jury is left to trying to determine if somebody has criminal intent to commit a crime, if you can show some kind of concealment where a person a defendant tried to cover his or her tracks, that's really indicative of their mental state, and it goes very far in, in the government being able to prove their case. What do you make, Chris, of the jury selection process uh, so far today? Do you expect it'll be difficult for the judge to, to seat a jury? Um, as Brenda explained in her reporting, some really colorful questions that were put before the prospective jurors. Should we expect this to take several days? I, well, I do know this. In the federal practice, especially in the Southern Eastern District, District of New Jersey, the judges have it down to a science in expeditiously picking juries. They'll have a number of hundreds of prospective jurors sitting, waiting in the wings, and they'll bring in those jurors in the box and go through the questioning process. The parties will have challenges for cause, peremptory challenges, but the goal is to get to 12 plus perhaps two or three alternates. So again, I'm it really all the facts are difficult to kind of assess. Everybody, every case is different, but it's hopeful that by the end of the week, they're getting to opening statements with the jury impaneled and sworn in. Very quickly, likelihood that we'll see those infamous gold bars make a debut in the courtroom. That's funny you asked that. So uh, if I was the prosecutor, I would definitely want those in. I would want the cash, the, the physical evidence to be able to be presented to the jury. Um, they don't necessarily get to take that stuff back to the jury room when they deliberate, but in the course of presenting the government's case in chief, I would want that stuff to be used. It's a strong visual, no doubt. Chris Cremiccioni is the former assistant U.S. attorney for New Jersey. Chris, always good to have you on. Thanks so much. Likewise, Brianna. Have a good day. Meanwhile, just across the street from the Menendez trial, former President Donald Trump was back in court today in the New York hush money trial, where his former fixer, Michael Cohen, is on the stand. But this weekend, Trump was on the campaign trail right here in New Jersey, where tens of thousands packed onto a Wildwood beach for a rally. He called it a witch hunt as he spoke to the crowd of supporters for roughly 90 minutes vowing to turn New Jersey red in the November election, even though he lost the Garden State twice by double digits and pledged to shut down sanctuary cities like Newark and Philadelphia if he returns to the White House. Trump also took multiple jabs at his Democratic opponent, President Joe Biden, over inflation and the economy. But he also referenced some locals, taking hits on Chris Christie and Governor Murphy, while inviting Republican Congressman Jeff Van Drew up on stage, calling him a star, and weighed in on a critical race, endorsing Mendon Borough Mayor Christine serrano Glasner for the GOP primary over her opponent, Curtis Bashall. That's on the high-stakes election to replace indicted U.S. Senator Bob Menendez. Political analyst Mike Rasmussen says the timing there was carefully crafted. Serrano Glasner has strong ties to the Trump campaign. Her husband has strong ties to the Trump campaign. This was an announcement that was designed for maximum benefit, maximum surprise. Come into Curtis's backyard, um, you know, right in the belly of the beast and make this announcement. And certainly it does blow up that uh, New Jersey Senate Republican primary campaign to some extent. Well, 11 Democrats have thrown their hat in the ring to run in the special primary election to fill the congressional seat vacated by the death of Donald Payne Jr., filing petitions by the Friday deadline for the July 16th race, followed by a general election that will be held September 18th. The frontrunner appears to be New York City Council President LaMonica McIver, who's gained endorsements from prominent Essex County leaders, including the chair of the Essex County Democratic Party, Leroy Jones. Also in the mix, Lyndon Mayor Derek Armstead, Hudson County Commissioner Jerry Walker, State Economic Development Officer Daryl Godfrey, Payne Jr.'s former staffer Shane Emilius, Brittany Claybooks, who is a former East Orange Councilwoman and Andy Kim campaign staffer, among others. On the Republican side, small business owner Carmen Bucco filed to run. Dozens of Rutgers New Brunswick graduates used their commencement on Sunday to take one final stand against the war in Gaza. About 60 students walked out of the ceremony held at the University Stadium in Piscataway, wearing colors of the Palestinian flag and kafiyas, which are the traditional Middle Eastern headdress, some holding them high for everyone to see. They quietly filed out about halfway through the graduation event, waiting until the commencement speaker was finished. Students say the demonstration wasn't 
wasn't planned by a specific group, but it caught on after several graduates began walking out. Similar commencement walkouts took place across the country over the weekend, following weeks of pro-Palestinian encampments and protests, including on the Rutgers New Brunswick campus, which students agreed to disband on May 2nd after getting the administration to agree to some of their demands. In our Spotlight on Business report, Atlantic City casino workers take their smoking battle to court. Oral arguments began today in a lawsuit brought by casino table workers represented by the United Auto Workers Union, who want a loophole closed in the state law banning indoor smoking that's allowed people to continue lighting up on casino floors. Workers say it puts their health at risk, but another union representing separate casino workers say a full ban? That would be bad for business. And as Ted Goldberg reports, Reports, they've got the New Jersey Attorney General on their side. The purpose of this law is to prevent sickness and death from secondhand smoke. The purpose of the Smoke Free Air Act is not to put money in casinos' pockets. The fight over smoking in casinos has moved from Trenton State House to a Trenton Courthouse. Attorney Nancy Erica Smith arguing in Superior Court today that part of New Jersey's Smoke Free Air Act is unconstitutional because of its carve-out for casinos. There's a fundamental constitutional right not to be excluded from a special law. And there is a fundamental constitutional right that they want to pretend isn't in the Constitution to safety. The one thing she has not identified is a single case that the New Jersey Supreme Court has ever said there is a freestanding right to safety. This lawsuit involves two unions battling each other. Unite Here Local 54 has joined the state's attorney general's office in stating that banning smoking in casinos would lead to massive job losses. One estimate, I think, was 2,500 persons in the first year. That has a net effect on the health of New Jersey citizens because those families that lose their jobs may not be able to pay for food and therefore it affects their health. Estimates have varied on how many jobs would be lost, if any. The AG's office wants the lawsuit dismissed and argued that lost revenue would be devastating to the state, while the other union involved says banning smoking would actually attract more gamblers. There is a benefit to having that funding available. It's not, it's not an amorphous, it is not a hypothetical. It is an actual benefit of a half a billion dollars to help those people each year. Not only does it affect our dealers, but it affects the general public that is out on the floor, the tourists that come into the casinos, the people that come there for vacation uh, that might not want to, they just want to go to the casinos and, and have fun, but they got to deal with smoke. The United Auto Workers Union represents around a thousand dealers and slot machine technicians in AC. Raymond Jensen Jr. is the assistant director for the UAW region spanning New Jersey, New York, and Pennsylvania and says employees who ask to work away from smoke are sent home. The lawyer for the other union, Unite Here, said in court that bartenders actually prefer to work around smoke. The gamblers are there longer in the smoking section, pay more in terms of tips. That is why in their economic interest, uh, the bar keepers, the bartenders, the bar backs, and the cocktail servers like to work in their sections. That's absolutely ridiculous. I've been working in a casino for almost 30 years. I've never heard any employee ever say, I would like to work in a smoking area. Smoking customers do not tip more than non-smoking customers. That's completely false. Pete Naccarelli is a dealer at Borgata and the co-founder of Cease, a group of casino employees hoping to get smoking banned from their workplace. They thought that the first day of oral arguments went their way. This is just an indefensible case. And so did State Senator Joseph Vitale. He chairs the Health Committee, which passed a bill that would ban smoking in casinos completely. That was four months ago, and he thinks that bill can pass the full Senate. I am optimistic. I've taken on tough issues in the past. It's not about me, though, but I understand the importance of this. And so do legislators. They know if this vote were put up tomorrow for a vote uh, and there was no outside influence or pressure, uh, this vote would pass. This bill would pass overwhelmingly. We've been talking to legislators a lot in the last couple weeks. Um, we think we have the votes to pass it. We're calling on the Senate president and the committee heads to put the bill up. The judge in this case said a written ruling could come in a few days, while others anticipate it might take weeks. In Trenton, I'm Ted Goldberg, NJ Spotlight News. On Wall Street, stocks wavered to start the week, with investors' attention turned to a key inflation report set to be out in just a few days. Here's how the markets closed. 
Support for the Business Report is provided by Riverview Jazz, presenting the 11th Annual Jersey City Jazz Festival, May 29th to June 2nd. Event details, including performance schedules and location, are online at jerseycityjazzfestival.com. New Jersey became the first state in the nation last year requiring students to learn about media literacy during their K-12 education. The sweeping law signed by Governor Murphy is designed to combat misinformation and help students navigate social media and news outlets so they can determine which sources are credible. Senior correspondent Joanna Gagas checked in with a group of Princeton middle schoolers to see if their lessons are making a difference. It says it was recorded on a documentary, at, but it, it didn't show up, so I just think it's fake. These middle school students were charged with determining whether two images from the internet are real or fake using reverse image searching. It's a critical skill they're learning in their media literacy course at Princeton Montessori School. He uses this artificial sword to disguise himself in order to take various pictures of wildlife. That actually makes sense because he's like disguising himself. Yeah. So it's real. We've been looking through sources and we found that it's a TV series. It's staged. And we are now starting to believe that it might be, it might have been staged. That was such a convincing video, it garnered 300 million views on TikTok. All this is to say, it's not easy to spot, you know, real from fake. Their teacher, Aish Sami, is a member of the News Literacy Project, a nonprofit organization that's working with teachers to develop best practices around teaching media literacy. My hope and dreams for the students when they walk out of the classroom is to feel, they feel empowered to sort of analyze information if there is need be and be more informed consumers of cyberspace. Last year, the Murphy administration passed a law requiring media literacy education for all students grades K through 12, but Kim Zito, a librarian who teaches media literacy in South Brunswick, says the initiative is stalled. The bill passed for an information literacy standards to be developed, but they haven't started yet. Um, I'm one of the volunteers who has, um, you know, stepped up to try to write the standards and we've been waiting since January of 23 to get started. The state of New Jersey needs to um, get this going in a more timely fashion. Zito also teaches middle schoolers and, along with Sammy, points to the rapidly changing world of AI that's infiltrating kids' screens on a daily basis. It's good to catch them at this time of their lives while they're just beginning. Um, I talk to them about standard-based news. Um, I use resources from the News Literacy Project, which has some fantastic free resources for educators. And they get it. My middle school students get the importance of um, checking their sources and um, you know, verifying information. It allowed me to make sure that I don't get duped or anything, which could help to keep me my mental me mentally stable. Could make sure I don't lose money on a scam or something. And it'll, it's just always good to feel like you know the truth. If it was something really important, like a, a national war, like if it was about the Ukraine war that's been happening, and something that might change my perspective on politics, it's very important for me to have all of this additional information. I definitely do feel empowered by what I've learned here because I now know so much more about the way that this entire thing works and the way the internet itself functions. But if there's any downside to all this education... When I'm sitting and scrolling on YouTube, I don't really want to do all that extra work but I feel obligated to. The burden of great responsibility that these students have, yet so many students around the state without a media literacy program are still lacking. In Princeton, I'm Joanna Gagas, NJ Spotlight News. That's gonna do it for us tonight, but don't forget to download the NJ Spotlight News podcast so you can listen anytime. I'm Brianna Venozzi for the entire NJ Spotlight News team. Thanks for being with us. Have a great evening. We'll see you back here tomorrow night. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. 
Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. New Jersey Realtors, the voice of real estate in New Jersey. More information is online at njrealtor.com and by the PSCG Foundation. NJM Insurance Group has been serving New Jersey businesses for over a century. As part of the Garden State, we help companies keep their vehicles on the road, employees on the job, and projects on track. Working to protect employees from illness and injury, to keep goods and services moving across the state. We're proud to be part of New Jersey. NJM, we've got New Jersey covered. If you need to see a doctor, RWJ Barnabas Health has two easy ways to do it from anywhere. You can see an urgent care provider 24-7 on any device with our Telemed app. Or use our website to book a virtual visit with an RWJ Barnabas Health Medical Group provider or specialist, even as a new patient. You've taken every precaution, and so have we. So don't delay your care any longer. RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together.